Hello, everyone, and welcome to... Wait a minute. I'm confused. <laughs> Where... Who am I? Where am oh, I? My. Why am yes. I here? This is Late Night Reds, Sunday evenings every every week late. And uh, I'm Chad Dotson, and I have hosted many a Reds show. I hosted Red Lake Nation Radio. I hosted The Riverfront, and uh, more recently, The Riverfront Reds show, because we changed its uh, name, because we have so many new shows. And one of those new shows is Late Night Reds. Our, our, our buddies Tim and Ben, no, not here this evening. They're doing some things we'll talk about later, but happy to be here. Really excited. Glad to see the uh, the chat's already going. Hello, Sydney, Pat, uh, Dave, welcome. Uh, I'm Chad Dawson, as I said, and uh, happy to be here on uh, Late Night Reds. Joining me is, I mentioned that we we, we got some new new podcasts here on the uh, on the Riverfront Network. The, the newest one is uh, Red Legs Roundtable with Seth Shaner. Seth, welcome. Happy to have you here on the Late Night Reds. Let's talk some Reds. You want to? Absolutely, although I'm a little worried. A, a, a few of the, we're, I guess, some, some of the older guys here at the Riverfront, and they're letting us stay up late. So that's a little, <laughs> hopefully we can make it through the hour or so. I hope so. I hope we can uh, can do this. No, exciting and uh, happy to be here and, and fun to talk about the Reds again. And we will talk a little bit about uh, what's happened this week and where the Reds are, where they're going. I'm still pretty upbeat, pretty excited about this uh, about this club, and I think I have good reason uh, to do that. But uh, before we go, I want to talk a little bit about your show because, I, first of all, by the way, hello, Sydney. <laughs> um, so t- t- tell me a little bit about Red Leg Round, Tim, because I know you got a, a show coming up here this week that, I don't know, every time you you – publish a new one of these episodes or you let us know who your next guest is going to be. I'm like, Whoa, that's, that sounds like somebody that'd be really fun to talk to. So yeah. tell me who you got coming up this week, who you had last in your last episode, who you have in your next, next one. Let's talk about that. Well, the last episode. Yeah. Last episode came out the week of uh, opening day. We had Pokey Reese and uh, I did, I didn't mention you by name, but I, I mentioned a, a riverfront uh, coworker um, always talking about Pokey and his hat cap and the jaunty angle. And uh, he had to laugh about that. Uh, he said, it's just I the way he put that. it on. Um, no, that was a great t- interview. And, and someone, you know, for me, having been, um, you know, a junior in college during the 99 season, I always look back at that season with such fondness for 25 years since then, obviously. And it's been my goal to talk to as many of those guys as I could. But I also got to talk to, and it'll be coming out Tuesday, Kent Merker. Um, he had multiple stints with the Reds, but but he's also, he's from Dublin, Ohio. So he grew up here and um, just, just a blast to talk to and he's actually he's a sports agent he's a baseball agent but if he hadn't done that i think he'd probably be in a booth somewhere helping call games because he's he's got that kind of personality he did a little bit with marty um years ago and he talked about that on the show that's going to come out on tuesday um but but he ended up going the other direction and representing athletes and things like that but a really good chat we had with kent yeah looking forward to listening to that and uh, keep up the great work seth if you if you follow the riverfront here on uh, on youtube or in the audio feed, you're going to get uh, the roundtable wherever you follow us. So, uh, so be sure to tune in. Let's talk just a little bit, if we c- uh, could, about the uh, the Cincinnati Reds. Maybe we'll talk about them probably for the rest of the show. Although I'm known to digress into <laughs> silly topics sometimes, but the Reds just finished a uh, a home series with the New York Metropolitans. Did not go the way any of us hoped it would go. Lost two out of three. Um, I guess let's do sort of a vibes check. Where are we right now? On the on the Reds after losing their first series of the year in their in their third series and uh, are we still excited? Where how are we feeling right now, Seth? What are your thoughts? Really excited about this team. I know obviously you know, that wasn't the way we wanted the weekend to go, but I, I guess one troublesome thing for me is seeing the way they have um, performed against left-handed starters. Um, again, this year it feels like for some reason the Reds are facing more of those than uh, than I can recall. Uh, these last couple of years, it feels like, and and it just doesn't seem like they're equipped right now. And Carnacion Strand and Candelario, the switch hitter, aren't aren't really getting it done so far. So so that that makes it tougher against those left-handed starters. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, look, we have some issues right now. <laughs> okay, this uh, the roster's not at full strength. But that being said, when I'm when I'm talking about a vibes check for this team, they're five and four right now five and four and now that doesn't sound great you know we want the team to be uh you know uh, win 150 games right there then they still possibly 158 and four is not out of the realm of possibility at this point 
But the Reds are only, quote unquote, only five and four right now. But, but let me ask you this, Seth. If the Reds went five and four every nine games, <laughs> the rest of the way, they'd finish up with 90 wins and 72 losses. 90 and 72. That's all it takes. Five and four. Uh, would you be okay if the Reds won 90 games this year, Seth? I would. I think that wins a division. So, yes, absolutely. Exactly. So, so that's that's my point here, which is that, yeah, you know, you don't want to win a, or lose a series at home. And um, the, the Reds, I wish that the Mets are, <laughs> the Mets are kind of a mess early this season. So I hate that the Reds uh, lost a series at home. But on the other hand, they're five and four. And yes, five and four has them only a half game out of last place in the NL Central right now because the NL Central has been crazy through the first uh, couple weeks of the season. But seriously, that, that that puts the Reds on pace to win ninety games. So you can be unhappy with the Reds only being five and four, but and uh, you know losing a series to the Mets not great, but. Um, I don't know. There, there's nothing about this team that we've seen so far that makes me upset. And a lot of people are upset. And and the other part is just that um, given what the Reds have dealt with in terms of injuries, et cetera, I don't know. Five and four seems okay to me right now. I'm uh, as, as Joey Goditza here in the, uh, in the, the comments, <laughs> the vibes are still good for me. The vibes are exactly the same as they were before the season. Matter of fact, maybe even better vibes for me. And, and then I'll let you take this wherever you want to go, Seth, because I expected the Reds to be good this year. Then all the injuries and the suspensions, et cetera, for them to get off to a good start, considering how many years over the last 10 years, the Reds have been just disastrously bad to start the season. The fact they started o- okay is you take sort of a, a deep breath and be like, all right, we're okay here. We're fine. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And it means they're not going to be three and 22 or whatever they were a couple years ago to start the season. So, you know, five and four, um, there were many years uh, between 2013 and now that we would have taken five and four to start a season. And in fact, if last year's teams get, got off to a five and four start, I believe they would have made the playoffs. So, oh, mm. yeah. So let's uh, let's run through where we are in terms of the offense, the defense, um, and uh, as a way to sort of do this vibe check. Then we're going to get into a, a topic that, that Seth suggested, which is some unpopular Reds takes. Some unpopular ones. It's going to be fun later. Um, a lot of people in the comments here. Pat Magooch. Yeah, he's great. Sidney Steer Price. Awesome. Yeah. Mentioning Spencer Steer. And, and we need to, I think that's where we start, right? Spencer mm-hmm. Steer. Uh, Sydney says, NL MVP, Spencer Steer. Um, I love that we're getting out of our skis already on Spencer <laughs> Steer. That's wonderful. Bring it on. But Spencer Steer, uh, the, the most uh, productive Reds player all season long last year. Now, McLean was great once McLean came up, but but just consistent. And, and he's starting out the year, and Steer has just been, uh, you know, off the charts great. Uh, it, it, well, here's the question. Is is Spencer Steer going to win National League MVP, or will they just go ahead and induct him into the Baseball Hall of Fame at the end of the year? One of the two, I think. Yeah, either one. I mean, no, I mean, he's just solid. And you need get, you need those guys. As exciting as we think Ellie De La Cruz can become, you need a Matt McClain when he was healthy last year. You need a Spencer Steer. You need those solid, solid guys. And Steer just looks like he's grown the last two years, just, just more and more – I think somebody said professional, professional hitter. Um, he, what did he say today? He didn't have – or yesterday, he doesn't have to carry the the stereo equipment to the, the bus or the airplane anymore. So right. maybe that load off his back is what's really gotten him to take off and and become, you know, again, maybe, maybe not MVP, but maybe an all-star and maybe just a solid big league hitter for this Reds team for the next four or five years at least. Wait, I'm confused. You just said not an MVP. What do you mean by that? Are, are you saying that not. Spencer Steer is possibly maybe. not going to win the Most Valuable Player Award? I'm confused. Well, he was so solid last year, and he didn't win the Rookie of the Year. So I He's know. hitting 406. Well, and, and after, <laughs> after he went 0 for 3 today, too, he's still hitting 406. Three homers, 12 ribeye stakes. 
I mean, they, we, we said we were going to talk about some unpopular Reds takes, and I think you just dropped the first one. Spencer Steer <laughs> is not going to win the MVP. Oh, no. I this is what Seth Sanders telling us today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no. Have you, yes, thank you, Sydney. Have you seen Mookie Betts' stat line? <laughs> Who? I've never heard of Mookie Betts. What? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? So, um, so, but anyway, uh, obviously I'm uh, being hyperbolic here, but what do you think about this take from, uh, from Scott here? If you're watching on, on the YouTubes, it's amazing to me how underrated the NL central is in everyone else's eyes. The NL central is the only division where every team's above 500. Keep underestimating us haters. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's an interesting topic of discussion. Because uh, and this whole show, we're not going to be like Tim and Ben. We're going to just go where we want to go. Um, so I'm an, uh, an Atlantic Coast Conference basketball fan. And everyone uh, said, oh, the ACC is awful in basketball this year. Then they have, I think they had six teams make the final four. Six ACC teams made the final four, I think. I'm pretty sure that's the way that worked. And so um, before this, after all season long, the Reds or the, uh, the, the, the college basketball reporters saying – ACC's down. So NL Central, everyone's saying that it's down this year. And, you know, 84 wins could win the division. 88 wins could win the division. Matter of fact, I was pretty sure coming into the season, still relatively sure that 88 wins would win the National League Central. But it's true so far. Last place is the the St. Louis uh, Cardinals, which I like saying the Cardinals are in last place, but – at uh, at five and five, so is the NL Central way better than everyone, or are we just talking about small sample size? It's only been nine or ten games, and uh, and a good start, relatively good start for all the teams. What do you think? Yeah, I remember last year the Pirates were in first place for about what three or four weeks to start the season. So, <laughs> and I know O'Neill Cruz got hurt last year, and that might have made a difference. But you know, long long season, one hundred sixty two games. I. Uh, I still think I like I said I think 90 wins it at least, but but 88 could win the division. I I still am not ready to go anywhere near. All these teams are going to be 500 above and challenging for all the wild card spots. That that just that doesn't seem possible to me with the lack of depth I see on some of the teams. Well, selfishly for me, I hope Scott's wrong. Uh, yeah, you know, because because I don't want the NL Central to be the best division in baseball no. because that makes it less likely the Reds are going to win it. I want it to be the worst division in baseball. That way, the Reds can get to their you know eighty eight wins or whatever and win the thing. This isn't the SEC where everybody cheers for all the good teams, even though their right. team's out of it. This is not. Right. This isn't you know. I'm not rooting for the Brewers when they're playing somebody else, unless it affects the Reds' ability to make a playoff run. Exactly. So, um, so we are live as, as everyone knows, we're on, uh, on the Twitters, on Facebook, we're on YouTube, we're on, uh, I don't know, wherever else you get live podcasts and we're probably there. And so I have the ability here in the, uh, in the Tim Daniel role to show some comments on the uh, screen and I, I, I'll show some comments occasionally. Um, oh, no. you know, uh, here's a comment from, uh, from Joey Gadiza, for example, if you're watching, uh, good start indeed. Big four game show to get down against the crew this early. Let's go. Um, and I do want to talk about the, uh, the upcoming series against the uh, Milwaukee Brewers soon, but I just want to note here that Pat Magooch had an intemperate comment that I will not stand for. And I'm not going to show it. I'm not going to show it on the screen here. So, Pat, you need to watch what you say when I'm here. Okay, you say whatever you want when Tim Daniel and, and Ben are here, but not when I'm here. So, uh, before we get to the upcoming Brewers series, Something else happened today that I really think we need to touch on. And I'm telling you, you know, I've tried to get less emotionally involved in the Reds over the last, you know, what, 30 years, I (laughs) guess. I'm 32 years old. So since I was two, uh, the Reds have been largely bad. But I try not to let the wins and losses and everything uh, uh, affect me emotionally. Now, listen, when I was 15 years old or 12 years old and the Reds lost, I was – I was beat up, but in recent years, I'm like, come on, you're an adult. Don't do this. Well, something happened today that really, really kind of got at me. Really kind of, uh, it was heartbreaking. And that's that uh, TJ Antone. TJ Antone, who when he's been on the mound, has largely been outstanding. Sydney, don't, don't make it, don't, don't, don't question what I say about my age, Sydney. How dare you? How dare you? He said six ACC teams made the Final Four, so Sydney, we can forgive him if his math's a little off. <laughs> Wait, what? And then, um, <laughs> so anyway, TJ Antone uh, has been has been really good. 
most of the time that he's been on the mound. But that guy just keeps suffering injuries. Today, one pitch and and had to come off, off the mound. Nobody knows what's happening because David Bell won't tell us anything even closely resembling the truth, uh, which whatever. It is what it is. But really concerned about uh, T.G. Antone, another injury. Any thoughts just uh, quickly before we move on to the Brewers? I mean, I was, I was so amazed that he came back after – remember, he made the comeback at the end of last year, and he, he had a good appear, few good appearances, and then he comes back and he, he he did a lot like what he did today. He just – he grabbed at it, and he, it seemed like, oh, no, here we go again. And somehow he was okay enough to build it back up and come to spring training ready to go. But you're right. It, you just – a guy that got himself to the point where he was after – remember, he didn't even throw as hard when he was younger. It, he really worked hard to get get that velocity up and became a you know, pretty na- – I mean, a pitching ninja loves TJ Antone, right, on Twitter. Um, well, I just, you're right. It, it's one of those things that makes you real sad. You were mentioning when you were 12 or 13, you let every loss bother you. <laughs> my son's the other night, last night. My eight-year-old came over and sat down next to my 13-year-old. And he says, I'm going to sit next to Joey. That's my oldest son's name. Don't know who we named him after. Um, he said, I'm going to sit down next to Joey. And they were all happy and everything. And then the or that was Friday night. And then the Reds lost. And next thing you know, they're up screaming at each other, brushing their teeth. <laughs> and I'm like, Joey, there's 162 of these things. <laughs> And he was yeah. so upset with his brother over nothing because he was just mad at the Reds. <laughs> I get it, buddy. I get it. Uh, we've all been there, right? So, um, send, sending out some good vibes to TJ Antone. You mm-hmm. know, um, just a tough break. And maybe it'll maybe it'll be nothing. Maybe he just felt a twinge and it'll be nothing. But uh, I'm concerned about that. Question from Scott here. Are we going to get Chad uncensored? I know Thursdays are uh, safe for work, but what is late night Reds Chad like? Oh, we'll just stick around and see. Who knows? Who knows? What would Chad uncensored be like? Oh, boy. Tony, I don't Bennett, know. I don't... Tony Bennett poster is being unveiled. I don't know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Tony Bennett. Thank you. The greatest coach in the history of uh, college basketball. Um yeah, I don't know. I don't know what uncensored is, but stick stick around. Who knows? It depends on how uh, how much Seth provokes me here. So, um, so the Reds are five and four. They are they won, won uh, each of the first two series, lost uh, the the third series against the Mets, and now it's the Milwaukee Brewers. Seth, what are your thoughts about the upcoming series? It's a four game set against the Brewers. How do uh, how do we feel about this? You know, the Brewers are the Brewers, but uh, these games are obviously in Cincinnati, four games. Opportunity for the Reds to really uh, early in the season. Basically, what I'm asking is, are these four all must-win games? Oh, yes. we <laughs> They absolutely are. No, I mean, I sat there at opening day and saw what Corbin Burns did for Baltimore, and I was like, oh, I'm glad we don't have to bat against him in a week or so. Uh, that's the first thing, I think. I mean, they, they are pretty stripped down. They made some – some signings, some some pirates esque signings of the last ten or so years of, or maybe even some Reds esque signings, I guess at times of of guys that are kind of either on the downside or or not really doing as well. And uh, I just don't see them being the contender that they've been the last few years. I could be wrong, but they don't have their manager and they don't have Corbin Burns, and and I'll take the Reds' chances these next four games. Yeah. So what what I'm hearing is the Reds are probably going to sweep. I think so. Yeah, I think so too. Probably the Reds will sweep these four games. They'll be then if if my math is correct, after these four games, they will be nine and four. And I don't know what that's on pace to, but that's on pace to win more than 90 games. <laughs> so um, I don't know, you know, who knows? Who knows? But now if the Reds can pull off uh three out of four here, it's, it, that that that's pretty good. That's that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping for three out of four. And uh I don't know, we'll see, you know. Um, it's just so early that I want to get excited. I want to be like, oh my gosh, the Reds, you know, they have to win these games, but no, they don't. But got Graham Ashcraft going on, uh, on Monday night, right? Monday or is it? Yeah. Monday night, Graham Ashcraft. And, uh, what are your thoughts about Ashcraft so far? Well, I usually let your brother speak for Ashcraft, but I know, uh, right. Oh, Nate loves, loves I, some Graham Ashcraft. You know, he gave up two solo shots to Bryce Harper and, 
honestly, that didn't bother me that much because you know what didn't happen before those? He didn't walk somebody to make them two or three run shots. So he's got a 3.0 ERA after one start, and I thought he threw well. Um, I thought he, he really did a good job. I, I'm looking this up now. The Reds are going to face a left-handed starter again, a man named Aaron Ashby. He's the nephew of Andy Ashby. Hmm. You might remember him from the 80s. Um, no, I wasn't around back then, but you, yeah, I'm 32, sure you can tell me right. all about him. He, yeah. he pitched for Milwaukee in 21 and 22, but he hasn't pitched in the big league since. So I'm not sure. I don't have much info about him, but he is a left-handed starter. So, Yeah, well, a left-handed starter. That uh, – what do you think? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, more about that in a moment, perhaps. Let's do this. Let's because I, I want to talk about some specific Reds players uh, and their performance so far, and especially I want to talk about this pitching because this pitching is really interesting to me. If if, uh, if the Reds pitching is what again, I'm getting out over my skis here, but I'm pretty excited about what I've seen out of Red starters so far, and if if, if they can be. Oh, we've seen. Then I think we're in really good shape. But let's let's go let's let's go ahead into the topic of the day. Okay. Okay. Which is unpopular Reds takes. Some unpopular takes. Now, this was your idea. Why don't you tell me what you were thinking when we, when we uh, suggested, when you suggested unpopular well, takes as a topic of conversation? Honestly, I've had this on my mind for a while. And, and a lot of what I'm about to say here in the next few minutes are more things I've been thinking about even since uh, I joined the Riverfront here earlier in the winter. Um, I certainly think we can talk about some of the, the current situations and things like that. But 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 I'm I have a few thoughts and uh, I want the commenters to give their own unpopular takes and I'm not going to be upset as long as you're not personal or something if if you don't agree at all with what I say because I think a few of these I know my third one is I've got three and I know my third one is really going to uh, tick off Chad so um, <laughs> oh boy he's I'm, teasing that one already I'm, I'm all right with some disagreements because you know opinions are opinions and and that's fine um, but but I I have a few. And well, before we get into that, though, the one current one I was thinking about, um, Pat McGooch said, is Frankie money a thing now? Frankie Muntos, Montas, Mo- however um, Nate's saying it this week, um, <laughs> he, he is really, really good. The only thing I'm going to look out for, and it's not a negative. Remember, he came back and, and had that one appearance last September with the Yankees and then he was a free agent and he came to camp ready to pitch right away. So honestly, he's probably six or more weeks ahead of all the other pitchers in the big leagues at this point, as far as how ready he was back in February. So I, I, I just want to watch that all season and make sure um, not that he, I'm not worried about him holding up. It's just more of, can, can somebody reasonably be all out from February until October? And so, yes, he so, can. Okay. Yes. Well, there you go. That's you the answer. My question. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Thing. Well, let me hear your first unpopular take. Although all right, I really want to get right. to this one that's going to make me upset. And, and yeah, let me we got to get this. to that one. Okay, yeah. the first before one. Before you is do this. it, before you do it, though, hold on. I do want to say this. Any of you in the comments, um, I don't care if you uh, say things that make me upset. I enjoy it. So you can say whatever you want about me. It's not going to hurt my feelings. All right, Seth, what's your number one unpopular Reds take of the moment? I have to remember Chad twists what uh, co-hosts say their words. Okay, I have to remember that. <laughs> All right. So the first one I have has been even back since early in the winter, and I I didn't tweet. I had my thumbs ready to tweet this multiple times, and I admit I chickened out. But I'm going to bring it to all of you right now, and that is, the Reds should sign Trevor Bauer. Okay. <laughs> that is an extremely unpopular take right now. Trevor Bauer's situation is a bit icky. I'm I'm willing to admit. That's one way to put it. I I, I understand that. But remember 2020 when we couldn't go to games. Remember, Trevor Bauer pitched for your Cincinnati Reds. He had a vlog. That vlog is the only thing that kept me connected to my Cincinnati Reds. And I remember fondly that season. And oh, wait, he also won the franchise's only Cy Young Award. Yes, Sydney, it would be the league minimum. He's already said that that's what he would sign for. He got paid $45 million to sit around by the Dodgers for a couple years. So, no, that's what I – but, again, I don't know. I understand it's not popular. No, No major league team has shown interest, but that's the first one. 
Well, that is the very definition <laughs> of an unpopular take these days, and I, I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sign on to that one uh, necessarily uh, right. at this point. But uh, but I like it. You're pushing the envelope. Okay, envelope. Can I, there you go. How about we? we uh, uh, so uh, there's. I would guess I would say there's a reason why no team has mm-hmm. signed him. Yeah, um, I, understand. I don't have. I don't have all the information, but um, I do like the idea of the Reds uh, having depth. I'm just not sure that's the depth. Uh, so anyway, whatever. Here's a here's a, a take from the comment section. Unpopular, maybe says Joey Gaditza. Uh Seth, you're you're sort of newer around these parts, but I think you know this. Joey Gaditza is from uh, the the land up north, Canada. Canada. Yeah, Canada. Canada. Yeah. yeah. Uh, unpopular, maybe, but David Bell should just plug Jake Fraley in, even against lefties. I just as soon see him over Stu or Bubba. So I, Stuart Fairchild or uh, uh, Bubba Bubba Smith. I don't know. Is there a guy named always, Bubba on the Reds now? I've always liked Bubba. Surely Thompson. not. <laughs> I know, but Bubba Thompson. So anyway, um, that's uh, that's actually probably not – well, I don't know. There's a lot of people that love, love him, Stu Fairchild. That that I was thinking about an unpopular take being something saying something derogatory about Stuart Fairchild. I'm not going to do it because his mom mm-hmm. is a regular listener to the show, but uh, she doesn't listen to the Riverfront um, or Red Leg Roundtable, but she does listen to Late Night Reds. <laughs> she already turned and, us off, Chad. Yeah, yeah, that's true. She's waiting to hear Tim. She loves Stu Fairchild's mom loves Tim. Oh, I don't yeah. know why that is. I, don't ask me. I think it's the beard. Well, maybe. I mean, the rest of us only watch Late Night Reds for Ben, but yeah, she likes Tim awesome. for some reason. Isn't Ben awesome? Yeah, Ben's the best. So anyway, um, uh, yeah, maybe over Stuart Fairchild, um, Stuart Bubba, as as Joey puts it. Uh, but Fraley does. I think that Jake Fraley looks as good as he looks because he is only hitting against hitters that he's a good has a good chance of success. I think David Bell manages him correctly. But maybe if you're talking about those guys, um, maybe I just I, I'm not a big fan of Jake Fraley against the. Uh, as an everyday player, I think he's a platoon guy. All right, here's my uh, here's my unpopular take. You ready to hear it? I am. Let's go. Uh, and and my concept of what an unpopular take is may not. I may be wrong. I don't know. I can't tell because I hear so many crazy things on both sides of every Twitter debate. But uh, here's this: Ellie De La Cruz will win no fewer than three Gold Glove awards at shortstop. Wow. What do you think? Am I wrong? Tell me I'm wrong. Now, look. Everyone who points out how young he is, 22 years old, and how little time he's had at the position, especially at the big league level, is correct. Unfortunately, you you said at shortstop, correct? At shortstop, specifically. So so not just anywhere on the field. He's not going to be Eric Davis out in center field. Okay. Um, Yeah, I... It is a very small sample size so far, but boy, he's got to clean up a lot, a lot. Is he though? I think yes, so. he is. You're right. That you're right. He is. Um, but but let me let me just uh, show mention some stats from another um, shortstop in Reds history. This shortstop that I'm going to mention was one year older during his first full season in Cincinnati. Okay. He was 23 years old, older than uh, older than Ellie De La Cruz. 19 errors in his first, and I say full season, but it was 119 games. So 19 errors over 119 games at shortstop. The following season, at age 24, again, Ellie is 22. The following season, at age 24, 29 errors in a full season at shortstop. Okay. Terrible. This is not good. And we can dive into the more uh, you know detailed uh, defensive metrics that'll show the same thing. This guy was a horrible defensive shortstop. And he never, at his best, had the range that Ellie De La Cruz has. Well, that shortstop, of course, is Barry Larkin, mm-hmm. who went on to be a Hall of Famer, a gold glover. Those of you who are upset about Ellie's defense, it's fine. I get it. I'm not enjoying the mistakes that we've seen so far this season. Uh, you know, I don't love it, but um, those of you that are giving up on Ellie as a shortstop already, and there are people that are doing this, which is insane to me. Check yourself here. 
get out of town. He's better. He's a, he's he's no worse than Barry Larkin was at that age. Larkin learned to play. If they had had uh, every game televised and uh, social media back in Barry Larkin's time, they would have run him out of town. And instead, he becomes an all-time legend. So that's my, uh, uh, I, which I think is an unpopular take, which well, is that he's going to win a gold glove. Yeah, Back I, off. Well, you said three. But <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I I think you hit the nail on the head, though, on the unpopular take, because you've done what social media manages to do and drive me crazy all the time. And that's go from one extreme, that he's kicked the ball around a little bit. And honestly, if you watch the plays he hasn't made, some of it's because his athletic ability – He's probably so used to doing it in a in a less whatever fundamentally sound way, and, and it's catching up to him a little bit because the game's just a little more faster moving at the big league level. But you've gone from that to three gold gloves. Like those are just the those are very very big extremes, Chad. So I think you've hit the the social media like like somebody's trained you. you did you go to? I know I know you're you're well versed in education. Did you go to a little extra? Um, online class or something like that on social media management because you you've hit the nail on the head and that's one of my problems with the old Twitter slash X or whatever lately it's that we can jump to such big conclusions back and but forth you, it can't you be said you, you said you wanted an unpopular take if I'd have said well Elliot De La Cruz is probably going to be okay at shortstop in the long run that's not an unpopular take well. As Reds fans, it would be a very popular yeah, take maybe. if you tell me Ellie De La Cruz is going to win three gold gloves. That'd be here's, a take from, here's a take from the chat before you get into your next one from Pat Magooch. Here's a take. Tyler Stevenson isn't that good. I I don't know if that's an unpopular take at this point. I think that's pretty <laughs> normal wrong? around these here parts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I still like him. I still think he's okay. I don't have any problems. I'm, you know, but it, 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 he's also... 27 years old and it's time to, you know, um, well, you know, so that's, I don't want to talk about Tyler Stevens cause I'm trying to have fun with this team. Seth, what's your second unpopular take? All right. Now the first one had a little ickiness. Um, this one's going <laughs> to have one way to put it. This one's going to have some ickiness as well. Oh um, gosh. But, but I, I think it's a function of age and I, we're, we're going to get rid of this idea that you're 32 you're older than I am. I graduated high school in 1997. My Not first full year actually watching the Reds was 1987. So I don't have memory really paying attention to Pete Rose, the player. Okay. Oh boy, but, you are just but, you're but, you're doubling it down here. But listen, Woo. listen, listen. Growing up, even before I cared about Reds baseball, when I was too young to care that much about Reds baseball, I knew who he was. My grandfather loved the big red machine. Thought he was a great player. All right, so here's my hot take. Pete Rose, the baseball player, is worthy of mention and admiration despite how swarmy he seems, how icky he seems as a person. Pete Rose, the baseball player, can be mentioned and talked about, and we should remember him for what he did on the baseball field and enjoy that. And I feel like... And I hate to sound like I'm the old man yelling at cloud here. I feel like a lot of the younger folks, even than me, who don't have even the loose connection that I do to his playing career, I feel like they just find it easier to dismiss because they see the icky things. <laughs> icky. Well, you're you're doubling down to the icky today. Well, they both are. I'm sorry. Here's I, a, and I understand yeah. they both are they both have their problems, Trevor Bauer and Pete Rose. <laughs> I'm not making an argument that they don't, but I'm saying we can recognize the greatness on the field without having to dwell on that other stuff. So here's what I'll say ab about that, which is that that is both a popular and an unpopular take. Okay. <laughs> because I think that on, uh, on, on Twitter, especially amongst the people that I, that I follow and that I trust and that I like uh, for the red stakes, that's extremely unpopular. Right. Sorry, Sydney. Um, because Pete is, uh, Pete is, uh, Oh man, Sydney, man, how long till Tim and Ben come back? Wow. Seth is running everybody away with his icky takes. Um, I would say that that is uh, absolutely an unpopular take for good reason. For good yes. reason. The flip side, though, is what the way you framed that, which is that you know celebrating for what he did on the, on the field. I think that when you get away from Twitter, 
is an extremely popular take. I think the vast majority of actual of actual Reds fans who aren't involved in the online conversation, um, it, it, it's easier to ignore the icky quote unquote side of, of Pete if uh, if you're not engaged in the online stuff. So I, so I think that's that has the, the the benefit of being both a a popular and an unpopular okay. take. So I I, I uh, here's what happened a few weeks ago. A good friend uh, said, "Hey, I, I got us uh, I got us tickets to see uh, Pete Rose." He's doing like a, a, a tour. Mm. And this is a really good friend and one who I did not want to. Uh, it's a really good friend. And so I said, I'll go with you <laughs> <laughs> to this. I didn't have to pay for it, I guess. And, and it's a friend who's been very good to me. So so we went and listened to Pete Rose talk about baseball for a, like, like 90 minutes. And um, it was wild. He said some hilarious yeah. things. He said some things that you really can't say in, in, in the year 2024. Um, he had some, he had did, did an imitation of uh, Tony Perez, the way Tony Perez talks. <laughs> he, uh, it was just, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to write about it at some point, but okay. my goodness. Um now, uh, my son went with, with me because we had they bought tickets for me and my son to come. And my son, uh, who's a freshman in college at this point, said, um, said, boy, that guy, uh, he's uh, – well, how do you put it? Because, uh, he, I mean, he knew that Pete Rose was, you know, the hits and, you know, all-time Reds legend. And he's been to the Great American Ballpark a thousand times, seen the statue, et cetera, uh, number retired. But he's like, man, that guy really thinks a lot of himself, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> or he's really impressed with himself or something. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, you know, it was – go ahead. Well, you know, and again, another unpopular guy, but but did you ever read that article? I think it was on ESPN years ago about how somebody gave Alex Rodriguez Pete Rose's number and they would text each other and he would tell oh. him about his hitting and, and A-Rod would go on these incredible tears for two or three weeks after Pete gave him advice. I just found that fascinating, like the baseball only side. And, and honestly, I understand these last few years, we've learned some even worse things about Pete. So oh, he's not, the worst. No. Yeah. I, that side of it. I'm not, but I remember being, I was in college when the sports century series came out from ESPN, you know, at the, the turn of the century when they honored all the best athletes of the 20th century. And you watch all these episodes and it's a hundred percent about these guys and their playing career. And then you watch the Pete Rose episode, and it's 10 minutes about baseball, and it's the rest of it about gambling at the time. And as a guy who never grew up watching Pete play but always hearing about it, I just always have wanted more baseball Pete Rose talk. And I think that's where this all stems from. Well, you know, uh, I guess the, the other part of this – gosh, Tim's never going to let us come back. We're talking no, about no. Trevor, Trevor Bauer and, uh, and Pete Rose. But <laughs> you're not wrong. You're not wrong. It's just – it's it's hard to – in this day and age, it's hard to separate the off the field. Sure, absolutely. So from the on field, if, if you're looking just at the on field, I think the other uh, uh, here's here's my unpopular take that I'm gonna I'm gonna zag a little bit on you here. This I didn't have this, but here's an unpopular take that if you just look at Pete Rose's on the field production, he wasn't nearly as good as what all the Pete Rose lovers think he was. Yeah, <laughs> he was no, good. Right. He was right good, but he that. was. He wasn't as good as uh, he wasn't, you know. But anyway, whatever. That's not what. I, that's not really what I wanted to say. Do we have another uh, unpopular take in the comments here? I thought I saw one. Um. Ooh, Scott, unpopular take. Worried that Ellie will revert to being no better at baseball than Billy Hamilton or Aristides Aquino. Ooh. No, I don't see that. No, I don't think there's any chance of that because neither Billy or and and I am an unapologetic lover of Billy Hamilton, as I've said many times on, on, on this podcast network. Uh, neither of those guys ever performed anywhere close to what uh, Ellie's performed in his big league career. Joe's, Joey Gadid said another hot take. Noelvi helps the Reds reach October baseball, but then sadly has to watch from the sidelines. I'll take it. Bring it on. That's Noelvi Marte, who had to use some performance-enhancing drugs. Let's see. We got anything else here? Um Oh, here's an unpopular take from Sydney. Thank you, Chad. Someone said something nice about me. Yeah, that's unpopular. That's, and I apologize, Sydney. I my takes 
<laughs> yeah, but that's that was the idea. That's what that's what this uh, topic was, right? We wanted to get into some unpopular takes, and I, I appreciate but, that. So you know, in our country right now, and we don't need to go any politics or even other things, but no, we don't. But but in our country right now, because of Twitter and because of television and things like that, like it's it's hard. Like like I bet you Sydney and I could sit down and talk about Pete Rose, and I would agree with Sydney about ninety nine percent of what has to be said. But at the end of the day. You know, there's not just one side and another side. A lot of times it, it melds into two, you know, it comes together in some way. And people that ri- rationally sit down and speak with each other on any topic, I think, almost any topic, can, can get along well. You go out and see your neighbors. That's what the best thing we can do in this climate right now is. is not is, true. Not okay. true. Unpopular take. I you hate everyone. Live on, you want to live, <laughs> live on the Internet only. OK. <laughs> no, I hate everyone that disagrees with me about anything. All right. Well, see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Seth. Just playing with you. Um, here's a, an unpopular take from from Sydney. Edwin Arroyo will be better than Noel V. Marte. Hmm. Interesting. Now that now that is a, a really interesting take, but mostly from from my perspective because we haven't seen a lot of Edwin Arroyo, right. um, and we've seen enough of Noel V to know that. Well, he's he's kind of special. Um, what are the chances of that, Seth? Any thoughts? Well, it's almost like one of the other arguments earlier. If that is the case, that's awesome. <laughs> I mean, because what we saw out of Noelvi so far, like you said, is is pretty impressive. Uh, so if Edwin Arroyo actually is better, you know, how much better are your Cincinnati Reds then? Yeah, no, that's a great – That's a, now, see, that's a popular take, <laughs> which is that they're both going to be great. Yeah. Right? That's very popular. Uh, Arroyo, unfortunately, season-ending shoulder surgery. Um, and so I don't really know what yeah, he's going to be. Know, yeah. what, what I was really hoping was that Arroyo would be incredible up until July, mm. and then the Reds would trade him for somebody that would help the big league team. That's what I was hoping because I love to trade all of the prospects. All right, my, uh, my second unpopular take. My second unpopular take is that I'm going to go back to the uh, well with Ellie De La Cruz. Mm-hmm. Ellie De La Cruz should bunt more often. This has been the uh, the topic of conversation amongst many on uh, online these days. Ellie De La Cruz is bunting some. Uh, now tell me, tell me how dumb I am. Well, not just in general, just about this particular take. <laughs> I know you have lots of thoughts about how dumb I am, but. Well, um, I'm Ellie scrolling De La Cruz through. bunting. Do you have any thoughts about it? I'm scrolling through. Here it is. I don't know. Maybe you didn't see my tweet on March 30th, 2024. Hear me out. Ellie becomes the best bunter this side of Brett Butler from the right side of the plate and smashes homers like Junior from the left. Well, so see, this is another example of why I should follow you on Twitter. No, I follow. I follow at Shaner Bob. It took me years but, to get you to follow yeah. me, Chad. Is that true? I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> um, so um, the the reason I say that, and again, I'm I'm being a little bit uh, hyperbolic again. I, you know, I, I just don't have a problem with him bunting. I just I don't have a problem with it at all. Number one, if he can bunt and get on base, that's a good thing. Now, do I ever want Ellie De La Cruz bunting with men on base to try to advance the runner into scoring position? No. I mean, maybe if it's the bottom of the ninth and you're trying to get a runner over to second or something. I mean, there, there are situations where a, a sacrifice bunt makes sense. Very few situations, but there are situations where it makes sense. But in general, if, if it can uh, help him get on base, number one, that's a good thing. We want Ellie De-, De La Cruz on base. Number two, if um, it causes the defense to be a little, uh, you know, on edge because of the threat of his bunts. I think that's great. The problem is this, and I will perf- I will concede this, is that I don't have any evidence whatsoever that Ellie De-, De La Cruz actually can bunt. Mm-hmm. And bunting against big league hitters is really, really hard. For me, bunting against little league pitchers, I said bunting, major league pitchers, uh, bunting against little league hitter, pitchers, <laughs> all right. <laughs> this has been late this night reds had unleashed. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm losing it already. Um, so that's my problem. I don't know that he can do it, but if he can do it, it's another weapon in his arsenal and I'm okay with it. Well, his entire Miley career, which again, 
wasn't that long. Um, his entire minor league career was probably not spent bunting. So you get back into that, that old, well, he spent his whole minor league career batting third and now he's batting seventh and you're asking him to bunt. Um, you know, it, it's tough to do, as you said. And, uh, I don't know. Did you ever get your finger hit by a pitch in the league when you tried to bunt? That was always That's bold of you to presume that I was ever actually in a game. <laughs> I was, on, I was on the bench, man. I was in the dugout. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, what if he get what if he what if he got what was to get hurt? Oh well, no. Well, whatever. You get hurt. Oh no, Chad, don't go there. <laughs> oh, here we go. Here we go. Um so I don't know. I if if he can bunt, I think it's an okay thing. Here's a boy, Pat Magooch with the unpopular take of all unpopular takes. If you're not watching right now on one of the video uh uh channels, unpopular <laughs> take from Pat Magooch. I miss Jim Riggleman. What in the <laughs> what? I met him in the hotel, the players' hotel, the team hotel in Milwaukee one year. I was up there. My college roommate and I take baseball trips, and we wandered into the hotel, and it's just gothic. Like, I mean, it's 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 amazing. They say it's haunted. Uh, but Jim Riggleman was sitting there. They have like an indoor. It looks like almost like Italy, where it was like a little coffee shop and all this. But it's all indoors because it's Milwaukee, and it's always cold, right? But uh, we sat down, and here he came and sat down and chatted with us for a while. Just pleasant fella. Very pleasant wow. fella. Well, I didn't – you know, on my late-night Reds bingo card tonight, I didn't have uh, praise <laughs> for Jim Riggleman being on there. But he's a nice guy, evidently. So that's good. Yeah. I see Joey Goditza's, uh post here, a hopeful take. Lodolo returns and stays healthy. He and Frankie and the Reds uh, go to, he, he, to October Bowl. You know, Joey, if you would have talked with us before the show, we could go back in time maybe and, and get rid of the unpopular takes and juice do all hopeful takes. I think maybe folks would be happier with us right now, Chad. But <laughs> the chances anyone's ever going to be happy with you and I, Seth, come on. You're going to have to, you have to learn. You're going to okay. learn. That's a, that's a hazard of this business is that people are not going to be happy with us ever. So uh, City does have a popular take here. There you go. I miss uh, Luis Alberto Bonilla. <laughs> And Jumbo Diaz. Thank you, Sydney. The yes. first mention of Lisa Alberto here on Late Night Reds. By the way, that uh, do you remember the name of that hotel in Milwaukee by any chance? Oh, I'm blanking on it now. I'm sorry. So, but you but you think it was uh, you think it was haunted by the ghost of Gorman Thomas? Yes. Although I don't know, he played home games there, so I doubt he hung out at the hotel much. But Gorman, that is. But maybe he goes and haunts the future opponents. I guess I don't know. You know, I I, I tried to make Thomas. a dumb joke. And, you know. And, you, you called have, me on it. Have you ever been on Sporkle.com? It's I have, video. yes. I go on there, and I always – and again, my I, I have baseball. Like, there's so much in my mind. I can never get the, that Harvey's Wallbangers team. I, I don't know any of the names except for Gorman Thomas. That's the, Gorman oh, Thomas. Well, Yount, and Pete, obviously. But, but Pete Vukovic? That, what about yes. Pete Vukovic? I know Pete from Major League. I don't. There you go. <laughs> You know the uh, the immaculate grid. If you all don't, if you all play the immaculate oh, yeah. grid, if you don't, you should. So I only play it because my br brother, another brother uh, who's closer in age to me than than Nate is, we play it just about every day. We don't every day, but um, our goal is just to get the most obscure 1980s player as often as possible. So he'll come up with a Rafael Ramirez. Sometimes, oh wow! You know, and then I'll come up with uh, Otis Nixon, and um, you know, I, I I throw in Gary Reedus as often mm -hmm. as I can. So. That's, Terry that's the way to play. Oh, Terry McGriff. Got to get a little Terry McGriff in there. Dan Bilardello. Um, so anyway, that's uh, that's uh, we we still have we're running out of time. We've gone longer than I had expected to go tonight. Let's hear it. You had a popular, uh, an unpopular take that was going to make me upset, and so, I am dying so, to hear this. I gave you two that that I didn't deem would upset Chad. <laughs> um, here's it. Here it is. I oh, like no, no, I like, no, I like no, the drop no, shadow. no. I like Say the drop again. shadow. <laughs> I do. I'm sorry. I think it's an age thing. I came through my formative years when the Reds wore white or off-white pinstripe hats. Look it up. They were hideous. They were hideous. And then they switched the uniforms, and the team's good. All right? The team is good. And they put a drop shadow under the sea, and we should never look back. It was awesome. I love the drop shadow. <laughs> and that's the one thing, Chad, and you're one of them. <laughs> C. Trent's another one. 
there's folks in this business, in this Reds fandom business, that can get an opinion swayed a certain way. And you, my friend, along with C. Trent, going back to like 2007, have successfully turned people like Sydney against the drop shadow. And you've done it, and I can't respect you for it because I love the drop shadow on the sea. Are you muted? I <laughs> muted myself somehow. I muted. I, I, I was afraid I was going to use the loudest profanity you've ever heard. <laughs> and so I accidentally muted myself. Oh my goodness. Seth claims that uh, this is definitely an unpopular take. <laughs> he likes the drop shadow on the uh, Reds, uh, Reds caps. Oh yeah. my goodness. And if you don't know what I mean, go look at a picture of any Reds uh, player for the last 10, 15 years. And I'll, if you look at the C on their cap and there's a, there's a little black drop shadow below. And if you're looking on video, uh, yeah, Seth, it's, Seth, it's, uh, white Seth, because of the black, but yeah, that's right. That's the reverse. But, yeah, yeah. um, the drop shadow is horrendous. Go back and look at the, uh, seventies and eighties reds pictures and that beautiful red cap with a red bill. First of all. Yeah. Well, and just, a, yeah, just, a, just a white C. And it's it's the it's the best. The drop shadow is awful. The reason to get rid of it, <laughs> Seth. You're right. I didn't think you could top your previous unpopular takes, but buddy, you just did it. That's this awful. Good, this is good radio, TV, internet, <laughs> whatever it is. We we shouldn't always agree. So that's Absolutely. The, that's what I learned in journalism, broadcast journalism, Ohio State. That's what I learned. Well, you don't always want to agree. It'd be a boring show. Well, we should always agree that I'm correct about everything. That's what we should agree about. Um, all right. One last uh, comment here, then we'll, we'll get out of here because I think this is a good topic of conversation. I do want to briefly mention some of the pitching. Mm -hmm. And because I kind of yelled at somebody on Twitter for saying this. So I'm going to, Scott, uh, repost it because I think it's a good take for discussion. Hunter Green will be better as a reliever than as a starter. Let me just say this. Uh, there, maybe there's a chance of that. If you look at just straight numbers. A lot of great starters, if you put them in the in the pen and let them throw max velocity for one inning, their numbers are going to look pretty good. He will be less valuable to the Reds by far as a star, as a reliever than as a starter. I just I I, I can't abide, and, and some of this is because I went through the era where they had a, a chance to use Aroldis Chapman as a starter and they didn't, and he was a great reliever, incredible reliever, four time All Star for the Reds, yeah, and then went and. Don't go look up his recent social media uh, viral video because now I just threw up my mouth a little bit. But um, I, I just, he's not going to be as valuable to the Reds as a reliever than he would be as a starter. So that's all I'll say about that. Seth, any, any comments about that? No, you're absolutely right. And I can, I can go back and look at, 2011, 12, 13, you know, all those years and see at one point the ship had sailed, but Aroldis Chapman could have been Randy Johnson. And he, he wasn't, and he was great for what the Reds had at the time, especially you think of those 2012 and 2013 rotations. They didn't need Chapman to be a, a starter. Um, but this Reds team needs Hunter Green in the, in the starting rotation. And I'm, I'm not going to give up on him yet to be at least – all-star caliber and and very good as a starter. All right. Last thing I want to talk before we get out of here um, is this starting rotation. Cause I meant to discuss it earlier and I just don't want to get out of here without talking about it. Cause this is the single area where I am most excited about the 2024 reds and it could all go South any day now. But when you look at this early in the season and you look at how Frankie Montas, 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 Mountain Tosts, Montañas, um, Hunter Green, Graham Ashcraft, and Andrew Abbott have performed so far. And again, we're talking early season. They barely, you know, pitched. But um, when you look at how those guys have, have pitched, and then you have Nick Lodolo to add to that group. I, again, I... I don't think this is – this may be an unpopular take. I don't think it's a hot take. I think that if if those guys – they don't have to be great even. If those guys can remain relatively healthy, 
knock on wood, and I don't want to do it again to you, Hunter, but if they can remain relatively healthy, that's that's the best rotation in the NL Central. And, you know, when you consider that the Reds missed the playoff last year because they were starting, hmm. you know, uh, Derek Law in September, it makes you think that, oh, you know, it again, and I don't want to ever presume health because with pitchers, it's a that's a difficult that's a difficult thing to stay healthy. But if they can stay relatively healthy, this rotation has a chance to be the best in the division, and I think that gives them a big leg up over where they were last year. And and, and I don't know that that's what makes me as exciting as excited as anything I've seen so far is that they have started out well. Thoughts about yeah, the absolutely, absolutely, and and we've got some good performances in AAA already, and. Beyond even Nick Lodolo, who who didn't have the best day today, but he was he was really good his first time out. Um, th- they're deeper this year than they were at any time last year. You're absolutely right, and that doesn't mean that all five guys are one, two, or three starters at any given time this year. It just means that the, that the guy you're running out there is competent at minimum. And Brett Kennedy, I see you, Sydney. Yeah, that wasn't always the case last year. It was not. It was not. So terribly, uh, terribly exciting. And so anyway, uh, that's that's a good place, I think, to put a pin in it. Maybe. Uh, Can I say one more thing? Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very bad storm cloud over the TG Antone situation. But how about Brent Suter today? Came oh in and three innings pitch, no runs. I mean, the, it's not just the starting pitching. It's that bullpen. Pagan's giving them some good innings. Uh, mm. Diaz seems to have it turned around a little bit. So, yeah. Well, I'm not uh, I'm not very high on Pagan, but yes, I think you're right, especially Suter. Um, I think Diaz is going to be fine. Uh, you know, Buck Farmer, he's Buck Farmer, but um, the 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 bullpen should be. I don't know, you know, again, but uh, the bullpen should be better than last year. And you're right, that's a that's a big deal. And Suter, Suter's my favorite red at this point. <laughs> that guy, I, I, I just, no one wants to be a red more than him, except mm-hmm. for maybe you and I. Seth, right? Yes. And yes. so um I love a guy that wants to be here and has come in and yeah, he had one rough outing, but uh, you know, struck out the side on opening day and yeah, huge outing today when they're and it ultimately uh, they didn't win, but huge outing that really helped them. Um I agree. I agree absolutely. So um anything else you want to add before we finish? Well, hey, I think you've gotten them before. I'm repping homage at Columbus, Ohio company. I will shamelessly say, anytime I get the chance, if you want to send a, send a swag bag or box my way homage, please do. I think they hooked you up before. Um, I've given way too much money to them over the years. I, I have got I've got something coming back to me at some point, I think. And I'll wear I'll wear any of this stuff. Come on, homage. Thank you. I don't think homage uh, provided what I'm wearing tonight. But no, they uh, didn't. They do make NBA sixers. stuff. They make NBA. Those Sixers. Want to check it out? NBA stuff on their website's pretty pretty sweet. The old Do they have like, Sixers. Uh, yeah, gear? absolutely. They make oh, they have right. these old. Remember the old Skybox cards that were like all crazy the, in the late eighties. They've got some uh, t shirts that look like those cards and and with with your favorite players on them. And and I assume that won't be Jason Tatum, but oh oh, Celtics and Duke. Get out of here, oh Duke. E. Who said Duke? Jason Tatum. Oh, that's right. He played for Duke. You're right. He's Thank from you. St. Louis. Also, he's from St. Louis. So, Oh, my Duke. gosh. <laughs> Jason Tatum, the most unlikable athlete in the history of the world. Celtics, Duke, and from St. Louis. Are you kidding me? There you go, the trifecta. Oh, my goodness. Seth, tell me about Kent Merker. Should we Kent listen Merker to it? Kent was awesome. Pat Magooch, you mentioned golf earlier. Yeah, he was known to be quite the golfer. He lives at Muirfield Village here in, in Dublin in Columbus where Jack Nicholas's tournament is. But you'll be surprised as I was to find out he's not playing golf anymore. And stay tuned. Check it out to find out what he's doing to get those competitive juices flowing. He's got something else going on. Excellent. Go uh no, Scott. I'm not coming to visit you in St. Louis. Um so go listen to Red Leg Round Table. Always, always uh, interesting. Some great guests so far, and some and uh, I'm really excited to see. All the great guests going forward. Listen to the Riverfront Red Show every uh, every Friday. That's posting your feed, and as it has been since uh, like we started that show in 2007. That wow, is that's crazy. Awesome. Um, and of course, the Riverfront Bengal Show, Riverfront. You lots of fun stuff going on at River at the uh, at the Riverfront. 
um, some new partnerships, and uh, it's, it's an exciting time to be involved with the Riverfront. Seth, man, I had a blast tonight. Thank you for uh, thank oh, you for joining us. Me too, and everybody, thanks so much for tuning in. I really appreciate all the comments. It was so fun to be around you guys again, and look forward to hanging out even more. So thanks so much. Well, thank you, Seth. And that's the other part, which is that uh, I had a good time talking to you, Seth, but the fun about this Late Night Red show every week is just those of you that show up every week, that watch, that comment, um, it's a whole different vibe. Mm -hmm. It's a whole different vibe from what uh, I'm used to and that here, and that's why that's why I, I I love it every week. So thanks for joining us. Hey, for Seth Shaner and for, uh, you know, Lisa Alberto Bonilla, this is Chad Dawson saying so long, everyone.